Hello listeners and welcome to this week's mini-series. I'm your speaker Casey and today I'm speaking with podcast creator Adam Dudding. Instead of preparing my own intro, I thought I would play you the trailer of Adam's incredible podcast, The Commune, which is the subject of our talk this week. For early access to full-length ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. Now, here is the trailer for The Commune and my interview with Adam Dudding from New Zealand's Stuff Podcasts. There was a lot of things like that where you'd think, what the f***? From Stuff, a new 12-part documentary podcast. He was into sex every day. The Commune. Sex, drugs, and a guru called Bert. There are crimes, but this isn't a who done it. it's a why done it. Good God, adults agreed to this? The Commune. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform or at stuff.co.nz slash the commune. You've already been welcome to Centre Point. So hello, Adam, and welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have this conversation today after being a keen listener of your recent podcast, The Commune. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Sure, why not? My name is Adam Dudding. Um, I make podcasts for uh, stuff and uh Despite the rather strange name, it's actually it's New Zealand's biggest media group. We're um, we're a bunch of newspapers, um, you know, Sunday broadsheets and and um, daily metropolitans and and um, local, regional, and uh, sort of the little advertiser where you can um, you know look for somebody to do your cleaning, the the full range. Um, but now also we're a website stuff, and um, stuff has sort of taken over the whole machine. And in the last few years, we've moved into podcasts. So I've been, um, I used to be a feature writer and uh, then I got interested in in doing the same thing, but um, with audio, because it's fun playing with microphones. So I do a, a um, sometimes daily, weekly uh, sort of cult news update thing on my YouTube channel. And I sometimes do find stuff articles that I'll reference in my news around groups like Gloria Vale, for example, in that part of the world. So would your articles have been something that I might have referenced if you were still one of those feature writers? Oh, quite possibly. So, I mean, so the podcast that we'll be talking about is The Commune. um, And as part of the rollout of that. So we, we had a bespoke landing page, stuff.co.nz slash the commune, which has got lovely artwork and, um, <clears throat> lovely artwork and, uh, all the, um, all of the episodes themselves, but there are about six or seven feature articles that well, actually, I didn't, I don't write a word of them actually, my name's on them, but, uh, this whole thing was done with my, um, colleague Eugene Bingham. So, uh, I, I host it, I read it, but literally every word that I'm saying and every bit of um, work that's in there, we, we worked very much hand in glove. Um, and at the time that the stories needed to be written, these are stories to promote the podcast on the news website, um, I was really, really, really busy doing the final touches on the, uh, you know, the soundscaping, placing the music and, and editing the damn thing. And so by that time, Eugene had, had reached the end of what he was doing. And so he wrote all these articles under our, in our names. But um, yeah, so there's sort of, there, there are various biographies of some of the people in, in the commune. Um, but before that, and, and then from time to time, I still write the occasional um, news feature. I went to Fiji and watched some people um, get cataract operations with the Fred Hollows Foundation the other day. So, you know, I'm, I'm still a regular feature writer every now and then. How did you get into a sort of a combination of uh, nepotism and uh, and kind of um, disorganisation? Really, um, my dad, way back in the day, my dad was a uh, well, he was a journalist. A um, little bit sad. He, his his first newspaper job in the nineteen fifties was some, for something called the Auckland Star, which is now defunct. But through the genealogy of newspapers, it still belonged to the group that eventually became stuff. So 70 years on, I'm working for the same place that, that, that he was basically, or 60 years on. But anyway, um, uh, so he edited literary magazines later, and so I used to help him proofread them. So I was very good with a comma by the time I was 12 or something. Um, and then I bummed around, and in my 20s, I um, 
he f the nepotism bit, he found me jobs as a sub-editor uh, for various um, places in New Zealand, particularly a, a magazine called The Listener. Um, and then I ended up in the UK at a certain point, and I really thought I should actually get a job. So I got a job and I worked, um, you know, do you know the, the Sunday Sun in Newcastle? I was a sub there. Oh, actually, and you won't know this probably, but are you familiar with the Shields Gazette on the top? No, no, South I'm not. South, it's, on, it's in South Shields. And I, for 12 weeks, I was a sub editor at the Shields Gazette, which was interesting. Um, lovely people. Uh, not an, uh, it, was a good, it was a good newspaper. It's just there wasn't a lot of news. The, um, the front page story one time was about a guy whose bins had fallen over. And, um, <laughs> and, he, and he wanted the council to come and pick them up, but they wouldn't. And he was angry. So that was the South Shield Gazette. But then later I ended up in London and worked for some of the posh papers down there. Um, so that was me. And that was, I was a sub-editor mostly. Then I came back to New Zealand. I wanted to change and got into feature editing and then eventually belatedly started writing. So I sort of did everything a bit back to front. And then after I've been writing for a few years and, and still loving it, um, I, I got interested in podcasts and then some opportunities arose and did my first podcast, which was a crime podcast called Gone Fishing. Go listen to it. It's got nothing to do with cults, but, you know, it's still kind of interesting. Is it anything to do with a, a case in New Zealand around a guy getting thrown off a boat? Close. Not Ooh. thrown off a boat. Um he, he is meant to have gone fishing and drowned, but some say he didn't because he parked his, his car was parked at the beach and he, his body was never found, but was he murdered? Well, certainly the, the woman that we talked to who went to, years, uh, went to jail 15 years for having murdered him. But um, anyway, it's quite the case. Oh my goodness. Go, do, you offer, do you offer your thoughts and opinions on what you think happened in that case? Yeah, well, with that one, what happened with that one was um, it wasn't my story, you know, obviously it's not my story, but journalistically it wasn't my story. I was looking for a podcast to do and I sat next to a colleague, Amy Maas, um, and said, I want to do a podcast, but I haven't got a story that sort of justifies it, that's big enough to do a, you know, serial just come out, you know. So everyone wanted to do a, a new serial. And uh, she said, ah, oh, well, I've got the story that's too big to just do as a feature. And we collaborated. And we made this thing called Gone Fishing. But, um, yeah, it was, I can't remember what your question was. It's shocking. I should remember. What Just whether were. you offered your thoughts on what you oh, think yes, happened. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, that was the thing is that, that, that Amy was absolutely convinced that the, the central woman, Gail Maney, was, was definitely innocent. And I thought it was possible, um, but remained quite uh, uncertain. And so we... In, in real life, we argued about it quite a lot. And then one of the producers said, you need to turn on the microphone while you're arguing about it. So, so we did. I so, do yeah. like that. I do, I do like that. I, of course, understand how people have to remain impartial, but I think it is yeah. interesting when you develop. Don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not com when, it's not compulsory. When you develop like a type of... Um, understanding of of the host's kind of um thoughts and opinions on things i think that can add like another layer to the podcasts that you're listening to almost and any of my listeners will know that i just hate unsolved mysteries i hate not knowing oh. without certainty what happened so i don't think i could have worked on that podcast without being extremely frustrated uh, interesting. it actually drives me nuts too and i think that's what yeah, it did drive me insane a bit. I mean, there were plenty of things to keep us occupied, like there was an incredible amount of, you know, there were interviews to be done and there were vast quantities of documents and court records to read through and so on. Um, so that was fun, really, even though, you know, it was a, it, it's a, there's a second murder. It's a, it's a double murder. It's, it's all pretty grim. It's some, some horrible things happening to people. But, um, you know, the process was enjoyable. But that whole thing of not being able to decide, yeah, it drove me nuts, actually. I, I, I have just the same attitude as you. It sort of, it irritates me when I don't know what happened. And you, as you said, you can offer up what you think, you know, might have happened or 
and but then someone comes back with a counter argument that you have to seriously consider <laughs> and then you're like well now i'm back to square one so <laughs> so that's well, gone you fishing feel, if you want to feel annoyed go listen to gone fishing because it'll drive you nuts and that's a stuff podcast well, that, that was actually a stuff RNZ, so Radio New Zealand RNZ um, co-production. We, we, they, you know, they're the state broadcaster, so they were all set up for um, in terms of kit and uh, engineers and and microphones and and some real expertise around um, audio storytelling. And we hit the story, so we collaborated. Wow, was, that sounds great. It was really cool. So, with the podcast that we're going to be focusing on today. How far from gone fishing up to the podcast, the commune, was there many in between? Because this felt so professional and polished and it just, you, you kind of hit the ground running with this show. Like maybe you were really experienced in this format of storytelling by this point. Yeah, so Gone Fishing was our first, but we had, you know, we that was pretty slick sounding because we had some really great producers at RNZ sort of helping us through some of the the starting points. And also, we both Amy and I were pretty experienced feature writers, so we, we knew how to tell stories. But the audio stuff, we were really given huge, um, you know, leg up by the by RNZ. Uh, after that, I did something called um, Out of My Mind, which was a series of interviews with people with. Um, uh, mental health issues of one kind or another and I was really I, I don't know if you know uh, Love and Radio the podcast Love and Radio Nick van der Kolk's uh, it's a reason it, it may have a big listenership but it's it's quite a, it's a bit of a, a cult podcast really in that it's uh, it's got a very particular unusual rather arty left field kind of approach sonically and so on so I was I was just um, ripping off his style which is <laughs> is there you know the narrator is entirely um entirely absent all storytelling's done by the by the um the guest and uh you can tell it's based off a very long interview which has been edited it been edited down so I did that with my one I'd edit I'd interview someone for four to six hours and turn it into half an hour Again, just about drove me mad, but and then do a really detailed soundscape, lots of music. Really, really fun, really engrossing process. And I learned a huge amount about mental health as well. But um, so there was that. So I learned quite a lot then. Um, that's, that's when I learned how to use Pro Tools. Um, and then, then uh, Eugene and I did a couple of podcasts. Well, basically, then COVID came along. Um, uh, I don't know how this, I think that was it. I think I helped out with some other people. It worked as a script editor on other people's podcasts for a little while. Uh, and then COVID happened. Uh, hadn't, we hadn't quite had lockdown, but there were all these um, coronavirus podcasts popping up around the world. And I'd found Eugene was a colleague who had done a, a really great crime podcast of his own called The District. Um, and I said, like on a Thursday, do you reckon we could throw together like a, a coronavirus podcast and then off um and we spent a couple of hours figuring it out and on friday we we wrote a little outline on monday we piloted it and tuesday we launched it and then we went out daily for about four months it's just about killed us but it, and then the lockdown came three days later so it was all done from this room well my end was done from this room his was done from 30 kilometers down the road uh, and then the pandemic got boring, so we turned that into, we, we sort of pivoted into an election podcast because we had an um, election coming up. I can't remember what happened next. Oh, and then we started on this, and it took a year and a half, which was horrifying. <laughs> Just went on and on and on. I absolutely loved the commune. I loved how you were able to go out and have face-to-face -face conversations with people who were core members, founding members of, of Centrepoint, uh, which is the commune that we're going to be discussing today, and people who had questionable involvement in the commune in terms of morality and ethics and all of those things that come, all of those qualities, well, not qualities, all of those symptoms of coercion that you can find in these environments but you must have some type of interview approach to get that candid response that you got from some of the people that you interviewed I was so so impressed and trying to take notes from uh, how you were able to piece it all together but also get all sides of the story to really paint the picture of what the commune was like 
throughout its entire existence. So can you tell the listeners, what is Centerpoint? Right. So cast your mind back to 1978. Um, uh, there's a lot of hippies about, but you know, it's 10 years, it's, it's 1978, not 1968. New Zealand's always a little bit behind the times. Um, but New Zealand, like the rest of the world had got caught up in the, um, you know, the, the, the 60s really, you know, um, uh, changes of attitudes, baby boomers with lots of, lots of money and a bit of time on their hands and, um, thinking, is that it? And looking for, you know, new spiritualities and new sexualities and, um, you know, wearing, uh, leather jackets with tassels on them and that sort of thing and um setting up communes and alternative ways of living and and polyamory and and all those sort of exciting things so you've got your raj niches and um you know clearly you've got your jonestowns and your and your um manson family and uh for, for good and ill you've got all these different alternative ways of of living of living going on um so bert potter was Herbert Potter was um, a guy who was very interested in this stuff and he was a pretty successful businessman. He was in his fifties. He had made quite a lot of money with a pest control business and he got very interested in this world of slightly hippier stuff, but also therapy and um, back home, he was sort of became the, the central point of this little constellation of people who are interested in this stuff. And they were, you know, doctors and social workers and nurses and teachers and um, builders, architects, designers, all sorts, you know, pretty, pretty middle-class people. Um, and they said, Hey, let's form a commune. And so they did. And about 1978, they pooled some money and bought a great big piece of land, uh, in Albany, which is not far from where I'm sitting right now on the North shore in Auckland. And Auckland is the biggest city in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, they just set up, got to work. The, the designers and architects and builders and so on so building building on the property and they 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 built huts and and put up caravans and and just did their thing and developed this whole i think they called them myself as a therapeutic community at that point in time so the, the their big deals were communal living uh free sexuality which basically meant a lot of people having sex with, with each other, really. Though um, quite often there were couples and then you'd, you'd have sex with other people outside the couple. Um, and the third thing was there, this huge focus on, on uh, therapy. And in particular, they were into these big, like seven day therapies where you, you lock yourself in a room with a bunch of people and there's a bucket in the corner and um, you moan and wail and, and uh, I don't know, just, just, um, generally lose your shit and then have sex with each other at lunchtime so um and they also they they, they were quite integrated with the wider, with the wider community at that point as well so they had you know as time went by some of them arrived with kids but as time went by they had kids and so there were there were 60 people and then there were 100 then there were 200 then there were 300 and the kids were going to the local schools and some of the people in the community worked out in the community um and other people worked inside the community and they had little businesses you know gardens and um, there was a weights factory where they made, you know, gym weights. Uh, and well, it takes 12 episodes to help tell the whole story. So I suppose I have to work out how much to compress this, but, um, it turned out that things weren't as they should be. And the open sexuality extended to sex between adults and children, basically. Um, and that became a matter of great concern. But even though people blew the whistle, um, it took a very, 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 very long time for that, for the, for the price to be paid for, for, you know, the, the child abuse, the sex crimes that were, that were taking place there. Plus there was this broader atmosphere of permissiveness and, and, you know, society's attitudes towards sex are, are bullshit. And, um, you know, of course, a lot of what they were talking about was true, you know, uh, there's hypocrisy and people are uptight and Victorian morals have done us no good and the nuclear family has got lots of problems and blah, blah, blah. But the solution they found contained this, this cancer, this, um, they just didn't look out, didn't look out for the kids.
when uh, Herbert Potter, or Bert, as he's known within Centrepoint, the leader and founder of the commune, when he founded this place, he'd been involved in a number of other intentional communities, but didn't ever feel like their answer was within within these communes. Well, he he went and hung out. He went to Esalen, and uh, I think these things he did were more uh, by way of research, as as I, as I understand it. So, the story goes the, the way he told it. There's a book um, written inside the community in the mid '80s by one of the members, and it's quite you know it's a, a, quite honest in a lot of ways, but it's a you know it's a propaganda piece as well. Um, Bert said that he saw an article in, in Playboy in 1960 something. Um, and he was a, just a regular businessman with this, with this company and employees and plenty of money in a big house at that time, uh, and got really interested in Esalen, which, which is, you know, therapy, screaming, hot tubs, massages, public orgasms, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he went there, but he didn't go there to join. He went there to see how it ticked and he had the money and he had the time. Um, so he headed off and uh, spent, I think, a few months there and came back, apparently looking a bit different. He'd grown his hair longer and he was wearing crazy cloaks and stuff. So that was, that was one. But again, so he was, he was looking rather than living there. And then sometime after that, he went to, is it Pune, where Rajneesh was in in India? You need to cut out my bear burps. (laughs) Up to you. This is the... the, the Adds a bit of character. (laughs) Creative control is with you. Um, anyway, uh, and he, again, spent several months there. And there, we didn't get this ourselves for our documentary, but in, about a year before the commune came out, there was a TV doco um, called Heaven and Hell, um, which covers a lot of the same material as us, but it's got a rather different compass. And it's, it's um, it, it, anyway, it, 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 it's, a, it's a great documentary, but it doesn't quite uh, cover the sort of the full length that we do, because we've got the time and space with a long podcast to really cover all the ins and outs. Um, But they had this great interview with somebody who happened to have been at Puna at the same time as Bert Potter. And he said, everyone thought he was a total dick. He he just wouldn't join in. He sat on the side watching and stroking his chin and, and sort of observing and looking a little bit superior. And he came back again. He had added to his armory of guru, how to be a guru tricks, you know, Um, But again, I don't think he wasn't there to live there. He was there to look. And he came back to New Zealand and and then got these various organisations and groups. And there was some communal living going on. There were a large number of people sort of living in and around his big house on the North Shore. And then he moved to the city, uh, to the inner city, and um, there were a whole pile, pile of people living there as well and doing therapeutic stuff. But they weren't yet doing the whole... It's a commune thing. So this is his only real intentional community in that sense. The Esalon Institute in Los Angeles is quite notable for being part of the human potential movement and the influences that a lot of people took from that institute at the time, like mm. Bert Potter, for example. Interesting, though, I just wanted to throw this in there. Charles Manson went to spend some time there and mm. through all of his belief systems... Um, and so-called charisma at the people at the Esalon Institute, and they they turfed him out. So <laughs> they obviously weren't open to all types of of ideas and rhetoric because yeah, uh, well, he. You'll he know this better than me, but they're still going. It's, it still exists, doesn't it? Esalon it does. Institute. Yeah, yeah, it does. So yeah. you know, they they obviously did things that were controversial and which which uh, probably scared the horses somewhat. But they haven't all gone to jail for for drug crimes or um, child sexual abuse. I'm, I'm sure they did things that, some things that were on the edge, but th- I mean, that's, that's one of the things possibly we didn't even make the point clearly enough in the podcast. It's not inevitable that a commune is going to turn into a shit show. You know, yeah. um, this is one story. So it was inevitable that this commune was probably going to turn into a shit show because of the guru, the narcissist, psychopathic leader and the, his particular set of characteristics, which gave him the ability to, to, draw people so far away from their ethical center but there are loads of other communes around the country and some of them are still going you know, you know um happy's got together and and 
made mead with their honey and 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 planted a bit of weed and planted a few potatoes and and fixed their old cars and did their thing and maybe did a little bit of partner swapping but you know it, it doesn't have to turn to shit that was about to be my next question as well <laughs> on, on whether you thought personally that but created this environment with the intention of living out his perverse nature of abusing children or whether he was genuinely taking influences from leading research in the field I'm saying in air quotes for all of my listeners that led to people kind of being given not permission but being given reasons why it's okay to have sex with children because some of the reports that that were coming out at that time which you detailed in your podcast kind of said well we've done research and it says that it's not harmful it's actually quite good i actually don't know i mean in in the end we just didn't really have any um resources that allowed us to definitively decide because he was a con man he, he was a psychopath i think we can agree on that or a sociopath or whatever the difference is somebody who the harm of others is obviously was not terribly important to him he was also clearly um you know a, a, a very a very talented observer and manipulator of people i mean one of the interviews we had was with someone who used to work for his pest company back in the day um who said he was just a fantastic man manager you know he had uh, he had learned man management man management is what he called it i don't think he called it that anymore um and i think it was partly you know some of these dale carnegie type things so he was able to in a reasonably positive way um empower people um give them the tools to train other people to be good pest exterminators you know be efficient make money um make people feel part of a group da, 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 da. so he had skills that you could use for good or ill and I, it, there's no particular evidence that he was a particularly wicked person earlier in his life there's no there's no real evidence of that and so I, I'm inclined to think that he probably authentically was really interested in that stuff. I mean, you can't invest that much time in something unless at least you find it interesting. I mean, even, you know, mad, dodgy televangelists, I usually presume they believe in God as well as ripping people off, you know? So I think, I suspect Bert sort of believed his own bullshit. Um, but also at some point, presumably... Uh, he probably got a kick out of the the power and control, you know, the, the, the power he had over people. Um, and then he did a lot of these classic things that happen in cults. And one thing that fascinates me is like, do people set out, it's almost putting your questions back at you, do people set out to make a cult? Do they deliberately um, do the, th you know, they, they go through the checklist of here's how to make people lose their sense of self-identity so you can manipulate them to your ends and da 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 or are these just such intuitive patterns of human behavior that all you need is a bunch of people a charismatic narcissist and it'll always end up like this you know these are like well trodden paths um but as to your real question which is basically was here a pedophile creating a system to enable that or was it something that happened happened incidentally i suspect it's a mix i think he was he, he got off on lots of things Reg, you know regular vanilla sex with with adult women um and then you know some of the more normal exciting stuff that a might a middle-aged fantasy might include of you know orgies or whatever um and then you've got the younger and younger um and so i think you know by definition he was a pedophile he he sexually assaulted lots of children um but i don't know if that was his driving force and one other thing i again from just from what people have said he got a kick out of transgressing and he got a kick out of winding people up and um you know the in-group out group thing with with cults he got power also from saying hey look we don't follow their stupid rules out in stupid society we're different and so doing something transgressive like sexually assaulting children um sort of has merit in its own right as a transgressive act and and a something to 
to cluster around. And I think later on, once the reputation was developed, that this was a place where people were, things were happening with children, I think it became a magnet to paedophiles. But that's a distinct thing. I, I suspect Bird may not have been primarily a paedophile. I think you can tell when that exact moment sort of occurs within the timeline of the podcast as well, just on how many individuals you interview that say, oh, and then more and more and more people were like, yeah, we're just doing all this horrible stuff with the children. Um, so I don't, I, like, as somebody that has children, yourself, and me, I think I emailed you and said, um, you know, one or two episodes were really difficult to get through just because of the age of my children. Mm. And um, I, I think there is a moment in the podcast where you realise that that's what the commune has become. Mm. And you mentioned that there were a few people kind of living together up at Bert's big house. And they were yet to form what would become known as center point and in its hmm. original sort of in its original genesis it's almost like a democracy there's a group of people that have an idea of right. what they think a, an intentional community should look like how they envision living as a as a family as a unit but it doesn't stay like that for for very long no so the 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 central character to the whole podcast is this woman Barry. Name's Barry, but she's a woman, and it's with an I. Makes it easy to remember. Um, and Barry, I mean, I I believe ever, absolutely everything she told us. She she's an extremely honest and and re reliable woman, and she gave us vast amounts of documents and so forth, which um, not only validated what she said, but it sometimes you know showed some of the terrible things she'd done before she you know got ahead back and back on straight but uh inevitably a lot of our sense of what was going on is th is through barry and i think there are people who would have different versions of what went on um and we did talk to you know we did talk to other people who were there the adults you know the people are in their 70s now who founded it in the 70s um not a lot, because uh, quite a lot of those people, particularly the ones who remained faithful to Bert to the end, are not very interested in talking to media these days because, well, just to be frank, they're the bad guys. Um, and some of them are unrepentant bad guys. So, you know, we, we don't, we didn't really get to hear their version and explain exactly what was going on. So that's just one caveat. I totally believe Barry, but, you know, it's, it's in terms of, in terms of balance, you know, she has a strong, um, influence on on the storytelling and because she's the narrator for, for this early stuff but there's that moment in the podcast which is she relates in the podcast where there's a guy called bill and um bert they're all trying to decide where to buy the commune and um bill chooses a place and it's not the right place for bert and bert just tears strips off him verbally grinds him down with this fast talking patter and you know you're useless and you're stupid and that's all wrong and that she, Barry defines that as the moment where that's that democratic uh, sort of turning point. Bert decided he was the guru. Um, but it is really complicated because even once they're in there and Bert was the guru and making all the significant calls, they were these were still, you know, highly able, um, well educated, well resourced, well connected uh, people. And they were making decisions of their own, you know where should we live and how should we do this and da, da 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 and yet for whatever reason and it seems very very willingly they did allow Bert to become their guru and for him to do you know because sometimes with some of the the, the stuff with the, some of the stuff with children happened very very early and quite a lot of people were, you know outraged this is terrible we can't you know there's that there's an interaction with this um a, a very very young child sort of having a crawling over this um this rather disturbed young man who just happened to be in the community and he got an erection while the child was crawling over over him and and the, the parent goes in and rescues the child from you know it, it's not an assault it's just like oh, okay let's you know let's just quietly deal with this and bert looks up from his book and says that's where you're going wrong that's where children screw their uh, the children are screwed up by their parents uptightness da, 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 da. so these are people whose instincts are in the right place and they're going, huh, this is, this isn't 
good. You know, you've got to keep an eye out for kids. Um, and Bert saying, no, nope, no. Nope. And, you know, there were always people leaving, but there were always more people arriving. So um, he managed to steer people way off where their moral, moral compass might have taken them otherwise. Once they eventually find the plot of land that they decide to to build their intentional community, but typically, as we've heard uh, historically with, with cult leaders at this point, very lazy, takes a backseat, lets everybody else get on with the hard labor, which is, again, as we've heard quite typically, 10 to 12 hour days of cutting down trees and irrigation mm. and, and all that mm. stuff that comes mm. with building a community. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I guess in part you're referring to um, our other champion um, former member, Robert, who I, uh, I think a lot of people considered him their favorite person in the whole. Yeah, um, he was definitely mine. I think I emailed mm -hmm. you again saying, I want to, I want to sit down and, <laughs> and have freshly cooked fish with Robert. <laughs> He's a, an extraordinary man. So, and, and you can just sort of see the spirit of what the commune was and what it might have been and what it was meant to be in, in him, in him, you know, this incredibly hardworking, um, dude who just loves the land, you know, the, we, we put in little bits, but there was much more, you know, the interview was really long and he, he was just, he was just talking about the soil. Um, you know, he loved concrete and he loved, um, sandstone and he loved spades and he loved chainsaws and trees and sheep and utes and um yeah he just he just just so full of life but he he was one of the people who ran around cutting down the trees mustering the sheep um probably slaughtering the sheep probably cooking the sheep um doing the piping doing the plumbing doing the the gravel on the the road while he's surrounded by yeah as you say other people who are there for a rather more hippieish experience experience and what is as he put it um lying around looking beautiful uh and bert and bert was one of those but i mean i it, yeah this, this happens i don't know if it happened i i know a lot less about cults than you do but um we interviewed this uh fantastic guy um nick bollinger who's just written a book about new zealand's counterculture and so that includes through this sort of a bit, little bit before that period, but we interviewed him. He talked about communes in general, and so there's communes rather than cults. But yeah, you know, people who think that you can kind of set up, set up, and and just live off the land. But it turns out living off the land is really hard. <laughs> you've got to plant, and you've got to weed, and you've got to fertilize, and and you just it's generally difficult. But um, yeah, but. Uh, Bert always thought he knew everything about everything. Um, when they had their 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 public berths in the in the big giant kitchen dining room area with the whole community watching. And you know, this was the era of um rampant home births, and that's all fine. Um and but yeah, home birth of 60 people watching is kind of interesting. But uh Bert would be right in there sort of calling the shots, telling her when to breathe and all that sort of stuff. And he just didn't have a fucking clue. He, he, he didn't know anything really. He just, he had extraordinary self-confidence. And, um, so yeah, one of the midwives told Robert at one point that, that she'd had to basically just tell Bert to go away because he was going to screw up his birth and she was the one with the midwife certificate and he was, but you know, I guess, it takes a particular kind of ego to think that you're a guru in the first place. So I don't think we should be surprised that, that he overrated himself on his ability to birth children and um, cut down trees and, and plan things. Um, yeah. I suspect he was actually reasonably competent, but he was also um, somewhat overconfident. I do feel like he had this really great ability to ability to, implement himself into every part of everything that was happening at the commune <laughs> but then not very actively so everyone always was aware of his presence yes and you know he would tell people how things should be done but never show people how things should be done that's the kind of the gist that yeah, I, I think, got I, I think that's I think that's probably that, that's probably pretty likely yeah so when you talk to Barry, and this is this was fantastic. This is similar to what 
somebody, uh, an investigative journalist named Siren Warner, who I'm, I'm working closely with, he is looking into a group called The Body, who originated out of Nikiski, Alaska. And for posterity, the leader wanted everything recorded, which now uh-huh. has obviously it's not working in the leader's favor. It's working in Siren's favor because he's collecting court documents and oh, he I is finding a document. He's finding interviews and he's finding recordings of things that were happening in real time in the commune in Nikiski, similar to what Barry's job role was at Centrepoint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the way she put it is, um, you know, some people were just lying around looking beautiful. Other people got on with trying to make the place work economically. Her partner, husband, I just realized I can't remember. But anyway, her partner at the time was a potter. And he managed to persuade various people to help him build a this huge pottery. And also 1970s pottery was very trendy. Um, and so that was quite a significant, you know, economic unit of Centrepoint. She really wasn't into making pottery. And she wasn't into a lot of the other things you meant to do. And she felt a little bit on the outer. But she was, she was a, a reader and a writer. Um, and so she started a little newsletter. And it was basically a propaganda um, newsletter, uh, which originally started as not much more than a, you know, eight pages of folded paper, um, with, she got a tape recorder out and recorded Bert's rambling guru garbage on a Saturday where he'd just talked about this, that, and the other, and some idea he had and why it was fine to have sex with children. And she'd record it and, um, and turn it into, um, was it Bert said or Bert? I think it was Bert's talk, because Bert said was another thing. Bert Bert said is the the magic words you'd use if you want anything to happen. Bert said we should build this here, or Bert said I should have the something, or Bert said you should do this for me, and then you'd get what you wanted. Anyway, so yeah, she made these tapes to feed the content to her what became I think was a monthly magazine and it got it got thicker and thicker and more and more glossy and they produced it with better and better um fonts and colors and photography and lots of creative people in there lots of really great photos in there um and she started interviewing people and yeah it's a it's a it is a fantastic document in two ways one it was this timeline. You could just see who was there and who left and who arrived and what they're up to and information about who'd got married and who which children had arrived and so on. So it was this incredible resource for just putting together the timeline. Um, but also because she had recorded these speeches, um, and there were there were hundreds, but um I'm just wondering if they're still here. I I may not have returned the tapes to to Barry. Have I returned them? Cause I might go and see if they're in that box and I can rattle them for you. Anyway, <laughs> um, she had kept around about 30 of these cassettes. So it's, you know, C60s and C90s and, you know, for a, for a 1970s kid like me, it was quite nostalgic. I was looking through all these old cassettes actually, um, and digitizing them. It took a while cause some of them I had to actually perform open heart surgery on the tape because Oof. they got so sticky. So I had to pull it apart and take out the spools and transfer it into a, into a clean shell and screw it back up and loosen the wires and shake it and try and get it moving. And then borrowed about five different tape decks till I could find one that was at the right speed and which didn't, you know, could rewind prop. Everyone's got a tape deck in their, in their garage, but they're all broken. You know, just ask your dad. I'm sure he's got, you know, a <laughs> cassette player somewhere. Anyway, uh, so we had these hours and hours of Bert rambling. But in the rambling, there's just so much. There's so much material. He, he, some of it was facts, um, but where it wasn't facts, it was just texture and tone, you know, storytelling-wise, being able to go. So I just, I just listened to the whole uh, podcast for the first time in a long time this last weekend, so I'd be vaguely prepared for you. And it fell to poor old Eugene. I, I digitized the audio, and then he put them through a transcription software but because the tapes are a bit damaged and because of the New Zealand accent in an American program, the transcribing wasn't super great. And then U- Eugene's horrible torment of the task was to spend many weeks just you know, tidying up the transcripts and parsing them, looking for the good stuff, um, trying to work out what was what. But near the end of, it's around about episode 11 or 12, there's this bit where we're just trying to say, 
Bert's life. Bert was this, Bert was that, he was like that, he was like this. And each piece is sort of demonstrated with this tiny snatch quote from Bert talking. And when I was hearing that, I mean, you're not meant to pat yourself on the back for something you've done, but it, it's Eugene's work, so I don't feel so bad about it. But I was thinking, oh my God, I've forgotten, A, how much work this was, <laughs> uh, but B, how much there was to work with. You know, it was, it was basically... It's like Barry handed us a paint box with 4,000 colours in it and we were just able to use them wherever we needed them for, for storytelling. And that, I think, is what is particularly fantastic about this podcast was the amount of resources that you were able to put into it from first-person testimony from those that were there from the beginning, from the children that grew up there, from people that observed center point from the outside and would see strange things going on or, mm. or you know, you would say, oh, there's one of those center point people because of the way that they would act or dress, you know, out in yeah. the, the wider public. That down to everything that Barry had collected and, and given over to you to include and the way that you were able to put it all together just made such an incredible podcast and it shot up to the charts and it was at number one all over the place for a really long time yeah no we were, we were very happy with response um we always we always hoped that it might have some kind of international cut through I mean the story of Centre Point ha has been told in New Zealand quite a few times um I don't think quite at this length at quite this level of detail but um over the years you know it was it was scandal it, first it was you know in 1981 there was a there was a big tv documentary which was just that it was kind of um what are these weirdos doing and that was a pretty substantial piece but that was really early there were no public rumors at that point about any misbehavior it was just wow they're having babies in front of 60 people wow they're running around in the naked in the nude hitting each other with pillows um or they sleep in these in these um shared dormitory things and and everyone's having sex with each other um but yeah so at the various times there have been quite substantial tellings of it but um we were aware that apart from maybe a little bit of awareness in australia there was there was probably no little to no international awareness of the existence of this place and we just thought there's a universality of themes and behaviors and it was it's you know it's of the zeitgeist you know this this uh, the kind of of course it's still going on now but the particular flavor of it um there were things a bit like this in you know washington state and india and uh wales and there's probably five of them in cornwall i don't know but the you know they're all they're all over the place the whole world does the same stupid things at the same time it's just that's 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 the joy of globalism so we figured people abroad might be interested um which is why when there's a scene where someone talks about having tea and bickies we drop in a brief translation for north americans so that they know that it is cookies um so yeah we we sort of had an eye to that so we were trying to serve the new zealand audience first but hoping that it would would be heard abroad and i've got confused now because we switched platforms um like our um our podcast hoster has changed and so it's hard to track the numbers but i think we've had quite a lot more listens outside of new zealand now than in, in new zealand um huge, really big listenership in australia pretty substantial in the uk quite you know pretty substantial in america um possibly more than america in america than in new zealand but america's awfully big so no, it, um, it never made number one in America. That is the end of part one of this mini-series on the Commune. In part two, we will discuss more of Adam's podcasting journey and Bert Potter's centre point. To find Adam's work, follow the link in the episode description or search for The Commune across your podcast player. To get in touch with me, you can find me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, host of the Coltvault Podcast.